Hi, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist, and welcome to another COVID debunking video. Today I'm going to be talking about the viral claim that Pfizer documents have revealed that the vaccine was only 12% effective in clinical trials. Let's just cut straight to the chase. Is this claim true? Absolutely not. And debunking it is as simple as reading the documents that anti-vaxxers themselves are sharing. This claim comes from the reported number of suspected COVID cases that happened in either the vaccine or the placebo groups during the clinical trials. And the definition of a suspected COVID case is quite broad. But in order to be confirmed as a COVID case in these clinical trials, they had to actually test positive for COVID. So even though generic symptoms such as fever, headache, or a general crummy feeling occurred in comparable numbers between the vaccine and placebo groups, only the confirmed COVID cases were counted towards vaccine efficacy. This is spelled out in plain language in, again, both the screenshots that anti-vaxxers are sharing and the clinical trial protocol that we had available to us back in December of 2020. So yes, when you look at the number of people who actually were confirmed to be infected with COVID in either the vaccine or the placebo groups in this Pfizer vaccine clinical trial, you see that the vaccine efficacy against infection at that time was in fact 95%. There is nothing new as usual with these Pfizer documents. So what can we learn by the fact that this claim that is easily debunkable within 10 seconds of reading the pages that anti-vaxxers are sharing? Well, I think we can learn two things. The first is that the reason this claim in particular, I think, is getting a lot of attention is because the messaging around vaccine efficacy in the beginning was generally unclear. Although the 95% efficacy against infection during the clinical trials was very clear from the data, we knew that those numbers would eventually come down. This is because the antibodies that the immune system produces in response to the vaccine will contract. This is exactly what we expect. The immune system contracts. It doesn't continually produce high levels of antibodies against everything that you're immune to. No, the antibody levels will contract and you'll be left with immune memory. This memory is what you want. It's what allows your immune system to recall what it encountered in the vaccine when it actually encounters the real thing so that it can mount a really efficient immune response and clear the virus before you actually get sick. That is the whole point of these vaccines, to prevent you from getting sick, not to prevent initial infection. And I can hear people saying already, but Dr. Wilson, don't other vaccines prevent you from getting infected? No, no vaccines prevent infection. Polio vaccines prevent paralysis and death. They don't prevent infection. Measles vaccines prevent severe disease and death. They don't prevent infection. This is true across all vaccines that we have currently available today. So in hindsight, it's now easy to see that the messaging around COVID vaccines and their 95% efficacy at the time of the clinical trials had to be accompanied with a clarification that that number against infection is going to go down, but you will likely remain protected against severe disease. And that is exactly what we saw. People can get infected and get a positive test from COVID, even if they're vaccinated, but they remain healthy. What other goal in this pandemic is more important than that? So hopefully science communicators, including myself and public health officials like the CDC, can learn from this experience and have more clear messaging in the future. The other reason that this disinformation is going so viral is because it's coming from these documents that are being released by the FDA in response to a Freedom of Information Act. These documents are all of the documents that Pfizer submitted to the FDA. These documents and the information they contain are extremely mundane and are not teaching us anything new. But because it was a Freedom of Information Act, people are treating it as if some big reveal that Pfizer was trying to hide. Even though Pfizer itself is contributing its office resources to the FDA to help them release the documents faster. Conspiracy theorists and anti-vaxxers just don't care about that. Anyway, the point is, the second thing we can learn is that there will always be blatantly dishonest people who are vying for any little bit of misinformation that they can twist and spin into their own uses in order to gain notoriety, profit, or to push their own political agenda. 
No matter how stupid the claim is and how easy the disinformation is to debunk, disinformation will always be there because it scares people. And in this case, messaging on one side has been far from perfect, and anti-vaxxers are able to capitalize on that, scare people, and further their own goals one way or another. So while science communicators do their best to learn and better combat this disinformation that spreads needless fear and costs lives, you can just have this rule of thumb in the pandemic that these Pfizer documents are not going to be anything special. They're not going to reveal anything new. Over the next few months, I'll be focusing my attention on finishing my review of what I'm now convinced is the worst book ever written, The Real Anthony Fauci by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. But if you want to stay up to date on everything that is being said about these Pfizer documents, you should absolutely follow good fellow science communicators such as my friend Ed Nuremberg. I'll post links to his and other science communicators' content in the description below, along with all the other links to the science that I talked about in this video so that you can check it out and read it for yourself. Anyway, that's going to do it for today. Hope you enjoyed that one. If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe and catch me next time where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.